information that I'm going to show you here, um, it does start to put things into a different perspective. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to go through some of the artifacts. I will touch on really quickly, um, and thank you, Jolene, for bringing that to my attention. I, in my own interest of collecting artifacts from the Sumerian culture, uh, became friends with a professional antiquities photographer who is based out of Iran and is flown all around the world to photograph um, very exclusive antiquities uh, archives. He was nice enough to provide me with uh, a, a set of images. Courtesy, I asked him to go to the Louvre Museum in Paris and to the British Museum in London, where the two largest collections of Sumerian artifacts are available to, on public display. However, there's also thousands of these tablets and cylinder seals not on public display and are just held away in some back room like you see on you know, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where you see that you know, big room, not that big. But they have thousands of these seals, and I aim, hopefully over the next few years here, to m form a, a relationship with the curator of these museums, maybe have my own linguist go there, translate some of this information that's of relevance to the information we're going to talk about tonight, and show this, because a lot of it is not on public display. And the information that we're going to see tonight, many of these slides, you can't just go into the museum and take pictures. And like she pointed out, the looting and things that took place, a lot of these artifacts we're in jeopardy of being damaged or lost. So being able to at least have a virtual archive or digital images to you know, catalog all this stuff, we can still look at that and, and, and uh, decipher what they taught us. Next slide, please. So the Sumerian culture, just giving you a brief idea, when we look at this little map here, uh, this is the, the Tigris and Euphrates River. Sorry, the pointer crapped out on me there. Uh, the, the Tigris and Euphrates Valley, that strip of land you see called Mesopotamia, that's uh, Sumeria, modern-day Iraq. It's been known through history as Sumeria, Mesopotamia, Babylon, preceding cultures, today's modern-day Iraq. That's where Sumeria uh, came out 6,000 years ago. And this is just a couple examples of showing their writing, the example of cuneiform text here on the top left. This is a cylinder seal at the bottom. Basically what they would do is they took a, a very advanced system of our modern day printing press, but used a cylinder seal where it would be a reverse imprint, and then they would roll it out on wet clay, put that clay into a kelm, literally keying the word writing in stone. They would, they would turn that clay into stone. So they had this, this primitive system that actually was very efficient of rolling out tablets and disseminating information to, to the townspeople very quickly. Next slide, please. So some of the inf interesting information that uh, I'm going to touch on tonight with the Sumerian information, uh, and again, I wish I could get into all of the details uh, because there is very esoteric uh, information in the Sumerian archive, especially if anyone, you know, myself being a Christian upbringing, many of the stories that we have in the Old Testament in Hebrew or in the New King James Version of English in the Bible can be transgressed to an earliest version in Sumerian. This is a, a cylinder seal uh, that's held in the British Museum. And interestingly enough, as we stated, that this idea of a, a, a Nibiru, the Sumerians were not only aware of all of the planets in our solar system, but they uh, cited this additional planet, a 12th planet, uh, called Nibiru. Now, they also cited that Earth, as shown here in this uh, cylinder seal, we can see the winged disk. If I can't get the pointer to point in on it, but that's okay. On the left-hand side there, that winged disk, that's the symbol for Nibiru, and as we'll see in preceding slides, the seven dots next to it, as translated by Zachariah Sitchin, symbolize Earth. The sacred number seven, seven days in a week, seven days of Genesis, the Sumerians actually had seven tablets of creation. So that story that tells you about the seven days of Genesis and this and how these, there's an actual Sumerian version recorded in stone uh, that is unchanged to this day, the original version of that story. So this is just a cylinder seal, which you know, I'm going to explain more in detail in a minute, that shows two very interesting points, that winged disk of Nibiru and the seven dots representing Earth. Next slide, please. Here's another uh, cylinder seal that actually uh, has the translation accompany accompanying it. And here's one thing I'm going to point out of interest. Uh, you'll notice that in the description, if you quickly read it, it says that before the symbols of the gods, above are the winged, the winged sun disk, a star, and a crescent and the Pleiades. So this is one linguist's interpretation, which is uh, well known within the Sumerian lexicon of, uh, of uh, people who can read this information, that the seven dots uh, referred to the seven sisters of, of the seven stars of Pleiades. And so they say that that's actually 
the Sumerians are describing the star system Pleiades. Zachariah Sitchin doesn't interpret it that way. He says that this is actually the seven dots representing Earth, which I'll show more of in a minute to substantiate that. But uh, it's very interesting that even modern, modern um, archaeology and linguist, linguists, there's still discrepancies as far as translations. The reason why Zachariah Sitchin is very important is because most scholars squabble over the meaning of specific words, the word Elohim or this word, and they say, well, it means slightly this or slightly that. Zachariah Sitchin takes into context all of the information. So it's not just a discrepancy over one word or this phrase. It's all of the information intact, having a bigger view, a better, a better uh, overall understanding of what all this information represents. So that's why I hold Zachariah Sitchin's uh, understanding uh, a little bit higher because he, he puts all this together, not just this word, that word, all the words, the whole meaning, the big picture. But this Next is slide. A this I'm is sorry? A this is Assyrian, not Sumerian, what you just showed, right? Well, what I'm, what I'm showing is that all the information stemmed from Sumeria. I'm going to be showing artifacts from Iran, Persopolis, and various other Ur, Ur, various other ancient cities. Iran, Iraq, the, the correlations from, as you pointed out, Assyrian, yes, all of this stems from the Sumerian culture. So if anyone has information or knowledge of, of some of these Semitic cultures, my basis for showing this is to say that all of this stemmed from the Sumerian culture. But Sumeria itself is not a Semitic. They're an Indo-European Indo speaker. Okay, sir, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me afterwards. Uh, my opinion on this is that all the Semitic languages that we currently have, Sumerian was the first one that we have record of. Uh, so showing this is a diagram of our solar system. I'm not sure if that little animation played. I missed that, but that's okay. Oh, good. So this is uh, an understanding of when we say the seventh planet, you know, how could the Sumerians know that the seven dots represent Earth, or how could they have been saying that Earth is the seventh planet? We always hear that hip term that we're the third rock from the sun. But in fact, if you started from the outer solar system of Pluto, Neptune coming in, one, two, three, four, five, Mars being six, Earth is the seventh planet. So the only way the Sumerians could have the perspective knowledge of saying that we're the seventh planet is if someone had actually showed them or who had seen that told them. And again, all the information that they knew, they say they learned from the Anunnaki. Next slide, please. So this is just an artistic rendition showing to scale that the Sumerians counted uh, the nine planets we know of plus the sun, our moon, and a Nibiru, making 12, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So this isn't to scale. Uh, it's just, again, just showing artistically uh, a list of all of the planets where Nibiru, as we're talking about, would orbit beyond, beyond Pluto, actually well beyond Pluto. Next slide, please. So uh, just, just showing that uh, through the work of Copernicus and through the understandings of uh, our progression of knowledge and in astronomy, Man thought that Earth was the center, of the, uh, the center of the universe. Through Copernicus and various other leaps of knowledge, we eventually started to use telescopes and do mathematical calculations to show we actually orbit the sun. But that, wasn't, that was not well known, and, 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 and it was not an accepted norm uh, until, uh, until just the, the, the last, uh, I think, in the 1800s, when we started to do mathematical calculations and actually uh, have powerful telescopes enough to start to see the outer planets. Next slide, please. But very interestingly enough, here we have a cylinder seal from Sumerian times that's roughly 4,500 years old. And you'll see that it shows uh, one of the gods, is symbolically, he's basically granting the plow to mankind in this scene. You see the Sumerians and the, the, uh, the god seated before them, handing them the plow. But as a backdrop to this cylinder seal, there's our complete solar system with the sun in the center. So the fact that the Sumerians alone are, fa are signing the sun in the center of our solar system is pretty interesting information. Thank you. Uh, that you know, wasn't well known until the advances in astronomy having to do with unaided view of the stars using telescopes and science. Yet clearly they, they, they cite it accurately as being in the center. Next slide, please. 